Here we're gonna look at two equations that are really too good to be true. The first one is called the freshman's dream, and the second one is called the sophomore's dream. So let's get into this warm up, which we'll call the freshman's dream. And that says for a prime P, X plus Y to the P is equal to X to the P plus Y to the P. Hmm, but that doesn't seem right. And that's because it isn't. This is not true in general, but we can make it true by putting another e part of the equal sign there and then putting mod P here. In other words, these are congruent to each other mod P. Or in other words, you could say that original equation was true in a field of characteristic P. Great. So, but we'll just do this mod P version. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and start with the left hand side of the equation. So we have x plus y to the P. Now we're going to expand that as a binomial. So that's going to be the sum n equals zero up to P of the binomial coefficient P choose n x to the P minus n y to the n. Okay. So now I'm gonna pull out the first and the last term. So pulling out the first term would be the n equals zero term. So notice there we're gonna have p choose zero, which is one. We're gonna have x to the p and then y to the zero. So that's what we get for the n equals zero term. And then for the n equals p term, we'll have p choose p. That binomial coefficient is one. We have x to the p minus p, that's x to the zero. And then we have y to the p. Now let's look at we, what we have in the middle. So what we have in the middle will be the sum n equals one to p minus one of p choose n and then x to the p minus n, y to the n. Great. But now the next thing that we wanna do is use a binomial coefficient identity on this thing. And the binomial coefficient identity we'll use is that p choose n is the same thing as p divided by n and then p minus one choose n minus one. Okay, now the next thing to notice is that this tells us that n divides p times p minus one choose n minus one. But since n is less than p and p is prime, that tells us that n divides p minus one choose n minus one. So that's something important to notice. But what that tells us is that if we take this P minus one, choose N minus one and put it over an N, we have a whole number, which means this whole thing right here is a multiple of P. Great. But now if this thing is a multiple of P, then that means that this entire sum is congruent to zero mod P, which tells us that this whole thing is congruent to X to the P plus Y to the P, mod p. Again, because we have the first term, which is x to the p, we have the last term, which is y to the p, and then we've just argued that the middle term is a multiple of p, which means it is zero mod p. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and clean this up, and then we'll get to the main event, which is proving this sophomore's dream, and we will start with this preparatory fact. We just proved the freshman's dream. Now we're ready to move on to the sophomore's dream. We're gonna prove this even though it's pretty well known just because I like to strive for completeness in these, these videos. So let's go ahead and prove this fact down here with induction. So maybe our base case for this induction will be n equals zero. So that's gonna turn this into the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x dx. So notice because we have x to the zero, which is one. But now we can take the antiderivative of this pretty easily. The antiderivative is minus e to the minus x. Then we need to evaluate that from zero to infinity. What I would like to do is take this minus sign, change it to a plus sign, and then change the order of this evaluation. Keeping in mind that evaluating it at infinity is the same thing as really taking a limit as x tends towards infinity. So if we evaluate this at zero, we get e to the zero, which is one minus, if we take the limit as x approaches infinity, we have e to the minus infinity, which is zero. So we've one minus zero, which is one, but one is the same thing as zero factorial, so we're good to go there. So now let's go ahead and make our induction hypothesis. And that is uh, that we're going to suppose this is true 
four n equals k, and then look at the k plus first term. So we'll have the integral from zero to infinity of x to the k plus one e to the minus x dx. Now what I want to do is perform integration by parts on this. So the general rule for integration by parts is you choose u so that it becomes simpler as you take derivatives. So that means u should be x to the k plus one. So that is going to make du equal to k plus one times x to the k. And then we'll let dv equal e to the minus x dx. That's gonna make v equal to minus e to the minus x dx. Okay, great. So now let's see what we get after doing that. So we'll get u times v. So that's gonna be minus x to the k plus one um, times e to the minus x. We need to evaluate that at zero and infinity, keeping in mind that we, when we evaluate it at infinity, we're really taking a limit. And then it is minus v du. So notice the minus sign is gonna cancel. I can factor this k plus one out front. So that's gonna give me plus k plus one. And then the integral from zero to infinity of x to the k times e to the minus x dx. Great. Now the next thing we want to notice is if we plug infinity in here, we'll get zero. Again, that's by repeated applications of L'Hopital's rule. So notice we've got a polynomial type thing here, an exponential type thing here, the exponential type thing wins. And how we're thinking about this is this is really over e to the x. So the denominator is winning, making that whole thing go to zero. And then when we plug in zero, the denominator becomes one, the numerator becomes zero. So that means this whole thing is tending off towards zero. Now we can apply our induction hypothesis to this last bit and we'll get k plus one. And then by the induction hypothesis, that's k, k factorial, which makes this whole thing k plus one factorial, which is exactly what we need to show that this formula is satisfied. Okay, so now let's look at our main result. In other words, this sophomore's dream. So let's go ahead and start with the left-hand side. So we have the integral from zero to one of x to the minus x dx. Now what we wanna do is rewrite this integrand using exponential function and logarithm function. So in other words, we're gonna rewrite this as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x times the natural log of x. So here we're just kind of using the following fact that if you have a to the b, that's the same thing as e to the b times natural log of a. So that's a fairly common trick when dealing with exponents with different bases, just to put them into the natural base. Okay, great. So now from here, what we wanna do is expand this as a power series involving this exponential function. So again, we'll use uh, this following fact, e to the u is the same thing as the sum, n equals zero to infinity of u to the n over n factorial. So that's a well-known Taylor expansion of e to the u. So we can rewrite this as the integral from one to infinity, and now we have the sum n equals zero to infinity of minus natural log of x to the n, and then x to the n, and then all of that is over n factorial, and then we have dx. Okay, so I've split that up carefully in light of some substitutions that we're gonna make in a bit. So the next thing I'm gonna do is notice by the dominated convergence theorem, I can change the order of summation and integration, and so I'll do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that as the sum n equals zero to infinity of one over n factorial. And now I have the integral from zero to one of minus natural log of x to the n power times x to the n power dx. So now let's go ahead and make a substitution. So the substitution that we wanna make is u equals minus natural log of x. So let's see, that means that x equals e to the minus u. So that's pretty easy to see. But if x equals e to the minus u, that means that dx equals minus e to the minus u du. We also know that x to the n is equal to e to the minus n times u. So that's another thing that's uh, fairly easy to see. 
Okay, so now let's see what that does to our integral. So notice all of these guys right here are going to become u's because we let u be negative natural log of x. And then this term right here is going to be e to the minus nu. And then this dx term is going to be minus e to the minus u du. Okay, great. So let's see what happens. We have the, the sum n equals zero to infinity, one over n factorial, that's still out there. And then we have the integral. We'll talk about the bounds of integration in just a second. We'll leave those blank for now. And then we'll have u and then e to the minus nu times e to the minus u. That's gonna be e to the minus n plus one times u. Um, du, and then we need a minus sign somewhere. So let's go ahead and put the minus sign out here. And that minus sign comes from this dx term. So the next thing to do is figure out the bounds of integration. So notice if x equals zero, or really x is tending towards zero. That means the natural log is tending towards minus infinity, but here we have a minus sign here. So that puts an infinity down here. So that's an important fact to keep in mind that as x approaches zero from above, the natural log of x approaches negative infinity, which means negative natural log of x approaches positive infinity. And then next, if x equals one, natural log of one is zero, so we get zero up here. So those are my x bounds of integration, and over here are our u bounds of integration. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is bring this to the top, and we're gonna move on to the next step. Okay, picking up where we were on the last board, we've got our goal integral, which is from zero to one of x to the minus x dx is equal to this infinite sum as n tends from zero to infinity of minus one over n factorial, then the integral infinity to zero of u to the n, e to the minus n plus one times u du. Now from here, what I wanna do is take this minus sign right here and get rid of it and change the order of the bounds of integration just to put them kind of in increasing order. And from here, what I wanna do is make another substitution. So let's go ahead and let t equal n plus one times u. And notice that means that dt is equal to n plus one du. In other words, du is equal to one over n plus one dt. So let's see what that is going to do to our integral. So notice that this du term is gonna become one over n plus one dt, okay? And then this u term, well, we can solve this for u pretty easily. This means that u is equal to one over n plus one t. So this is gonna be equal to t to the n over n plus one to the n. So that's what we get if we raise this to the nth power. And then notice our exponential right here. That's just going to be equal to minus t because that's actually how we chose this substitution to simplify that exponent. And then the bounds stay the same because notice if u equals zero, t equals zero, and as u tends towards infinity, t to tends towards infinity. So that makes this whole thing equal to the sum n equals zero to infinity of one over n factorial. And now we have the integral from zero to infinity of one over n plus one to the n plus one. So let's see how we got that. We have n plus one to the n here multiplied by another n plus one in the denominator. So that gives us n plus one to the n plus one. And now we're gonna have a t to the n, e to the minus t dt. But now notice that this guy right here is just a constant. So we can really just take that out and that means all we need to do is find the integral from zero to infinity of t to the n e to the minus t dt. But we proved that something like that is equal to n factorial. Well, that n factorial that comes out will cancel this n factorial here and we'll be left with the sum n equals zero to infinity of one over n plus one to the n plus one. Now we can easily re-index that to start at one instead of zero and we'll have the sum n equal one to infinity of one over n to the n. Or 
In other words, the sum n equal one to infinity of n to the minus n. So we have achieved this surprising formula, which says that the integral of x to the minus x over zero to one is the same as the sum from n one to infinity of n to the minus n. And that is known as the sophomore's dream. Maybe before we stop, what do you think the junior's dream or the senior's dream or maybe the first year graduate student's dream would be? I think those are pretty interesting questions as well. And that's a good place to stop.